This is a production of Cornell University. Let's talk about genomes. So uh, Franny said she, when I met her just a little while ago, she said she likes to work with things she can see. And so, you know, who wants to work with DNA, which you can't see? So um, the problem of seeing the DNA is really important for understanding how the genome works. And so we're, talk, we're going to talk about data visualization. So uh, before I start, I'd like to just, some of you may have missed it, but in the beginning of September, there was a major scientific advance. 30 publications were published simultaneously in Science, Nature, and other journals. Uh, which is the fruit coming out of the ENCODE project and the latest phase of the ENCODE project. And so this was uh, a paradigm shifting uh, outcome and it, it, it says something about the genome which I'd really like to communicate to you. The leader of this, this vast consortium of scientists, uh, something like uh, several, I think over a hundred scientists were part of the consortium, over a hundred million dollars spent on this. It's basically phase three of the genome project. And you know, once you have a genome, you have to figure out what it's doing. And so they've been trying to understand what, what the genome does. This is what the leader of the program said. He said, the genome is a jungle of information. It is multi-layered and multi-dimensional, and that higher genomes are mostly functional. A major, major paradigm shift in terms of understanding of the genome. And so uh, the bottom line is, that not only does the, the, we usually think of the genetic code, you know, the code that goes from DNA to RNA to protein. Well, that only accounts for one to two percent of the genome. There are many other codes, many, many codes in the genome, many languages, and they overlap. And if you ask a computer scientist if they could write overlapping code, they would just, you know, their eyes would go crossed. So this is, uh, this is an amazing reality, but it, it, it suggests that understanding the genome will be the challenge for the uh, people who raised their hand who were born before uh, 1980. This is that generation's challenge to figure out what in the world is going on inside the genome. And what they've discovered so far, most people acknowledge is just the tip of the iceberg. So how do you try to even approach all this uh, new data? I'd just like to tell you about what data visualization is. It's an area of science. It's, uh, Here's the bottom line. The best pattern recognition software in the universe is our brain. And so uh, you can program a computer to look for a pattern, but it'll only look for the pattern you asked it to look for. Whereas our brain, everything we look, our brain automatically recognizes patterns. And so that's, um, that's something that is unique to the human brain. They still haven't developed a computer that can recognize a face, for example. So, Data visualization is the, is the, um, uh, involves the process of making data visual, and when it's visual, then our brain can take over and easily recognize patterns. And that's the origin of this program called Skittle. And so if you look, some of you have seen uh, genomic data, and it's just endless A's, T's, C's, and G's, and you will find that your brain can't really, you know, when you look at a few million of those, it, your brain doesn't see any pattern. If you do something as simple as adding color to the scheme, you can start to see patterns. And so um, Skittle, the first, first dimension of Skittle is simple colorization of nucleotides. And so um, I've suggested, now for the people in Geneva, I'm just gonna take a minute and show them some live uh, running of the program. And I'd be happy to share it with you when I'm back up in Geneva. Uh, maybe next week, but uh, bear with me just for a moment, and I'm going to escape this and close this, and I'm going to pull up the Skittle program. Whoops, that's not the one I wanted. There it is. Okay, so this is, uh, and I, maybe, maybe the people in Geneva can see this, but this is a display of 40,000 approximately 40,000 pixels, and each pixel represents a nucleotide. So the, this is chromosome 10 of corn, and the first pixel is green, meaning it's a guanine, okay? So you're looking at 40,000 uh, letters, but because it's colorized, you can start to see patterns. And so uh, over here, the way Skittle works is there's basic settings at the top. You can determine the width of this, 
You can determine the zoom in and zoom out. You can do uh, dis determine go s zoom to any starting point you want. There's ways of bringing in new data, like from a genome browser, and there are there are basic functions that will be can be tied to your mouse. And then over here, there are different displays. So right now, we're looking at a simple nucleotide display. So this is raw data. This is the data. Uh, it's just the, the data as a genome, uh, as a FASTA file colorized. So the, let me just show you. The gray are unsequenced gaps. So let's just see what we can do here. Um, one of the things we can do is we can change the diameter. You can perhaps see that I'm making it narrower. And if I close, if I change it enough, you see a new pattern. So basically, these are tandem repeats. And if I said, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you, that's a tandem repeat. And if you have a, a line break after the U every time, all the letters of I love you, I love you will line up. And you'll get these columns, straight up and down columns, right? So that's what you're seeing here is a tandem repeat. And this is a large tandem repeat. And it's throughout the, the corn genome. It's especially abundant in the centromeric region. And it's, uh, but it's throughout the genome. It may represent 5 or 10% of the genome. So it's a major element. And if I told you, talked about tandem repeats, without a visualization, you wouldn't immediately get it. But when you see a picture of it, it's really obvious, isn't it? OK, so um, that just, I'm going to jump back to the PowerPoint for the sake of the people at Geneva. But, um, but perhaps that is helpful to you. OK. So people at Geneva, I'd be happy to just ask me, and I'll show you how Skittle works later. Um, OK, this is a picture of uh, the corn genome. And I like it because it shows a couple of things that are very significant. One is uh, it shows the, um, the very different nucleotide percentages. There are areas that are GC rich. And there are areas that are AT rich. And sometimes you have areas that are cytosine rich. They're mostly red. And so, and so you have, um, it's not, you might picture it as a uniform blend, but actually there's these huge d variations. This, these areas that are GC rich are where the genes are. So these are genic regions. And if you look really carefully, you'll see a tandem repeat here and a tandem repeat at the beginning of the end of this gene. So let's just look at that a little more carefully. Um, this is a similar tandem, this is a similar genic region. And uh, you can see there's a couple of things. One, one is it's GC rich. Another thing is that if you look really carefully in here, you'll see a texture, which is called a, which, which we call the three-mer pattern. But that reflects codon preference. In other words, you can recognize protein coding regions. OK, I'm sorry, I haven't explained what this new display is. This is the repeat map. So if you have a light colored pixel here, that means that a string this long has repeated once. If you have a series of pixels here, that means you can see it correlates with this repeat here where these are lining up. So this is a very, very sensitive map of repeating units within the genome. And it's, it's much more sensitive than any other uh, genome tool for detecting repetition within the genome. And what you see here very carefully, if you look really carefully, is there's a pattern of dark, dark light, dark, dark light. And uh, that pattern is throughout the genome of all organisms. And it, it represents the nature of the protein coding, uh, the codon preferences. And what's significant here is that there's a tandem repeat at the beginning and the end of the genic region. and so. That means that those tandem repeats, this is something you find throughout the corn genome. It is th in thousands and thousands of places in the corn genome. It means normally people have always thought that tandem repeats are junk DNA. They're just pro mistakes that happen during DNA replication. But what we find is that these are strategically at the beginning and the end of these genic regions. 
So they're not junk. They're, they're precisely where they're supposed to be, and they always match. They come in pairs. They kind of represent the beginning and the end of the exon, the coating, protein coating region. The other interesting thing is, um, it's a little bit off scale here, but we, we can look at where the annotated exons, recognized exons are, and most of the things we see with Skittle have never been described before. In other words, they've been invisible to the normal gene searches. And so we're seeing uh, functional units within the genome that weren't visible using other technologies for analyzing genomes. So this is uh, an example of a similar, similar genic region. It's very AT rich. You recognize it right away, right? It's very distinct. Here you can see the, the texture that I spoke of. Can you see that texture in the back? That's, that's very distinctive of protein coding regions. And then you can see here, this is called an exon track. This is, these lines are just marking where there's a protein coding exon. And what you see is, uh, in this case, this exon has been identified by previous researchers as a, a functional gene, genic unit. But 99% of these structures that we see have not been identified previously as exons. So we have a new way of, dis of identifying exons in any genome, which is very sensitive and very exciting. Uh, just uh, it's more of the same. You can see a genic region that's what I call bracketed by tandem repeats. And the tandem repeats, again, are these, are these repeating units. So that's, uh, that's really exciting. Here's a closer look at the ten the, this texture. And you can actually see that the, the, the greenish yellow, the guanines, are lining up. Because this is a very non-random, this is the exon. Okay, we know this is the exon. We can see that it has the exonic signature. And we can actually see the, in the raw data, we can actually see that uh, the, the third nucleotide tends to always be a G. So yes. Yeah, I'm sorry, I should have expressed that. It's like a book, so you go to the end of the line and go back to the beginning. So it's rastered. So, um, I've got another yes. How much of the genome are we looking at in the picture? Okay, so this display length is 88,000 nucleotides are present in this picture right here out of 3 billion. So, um, so you'd have thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of pages like this. So you can, I've spent, uh, just looking at one chromosome, you can spend hours and just get a, a few uh, highlights of that chromosome. So there's a huge amount of data. Um, this is, again, what we, one of the things we can do is we can, if we see a tandem repeat here, we know there's a tandem repeat here because here's the repeat map. So now we have a new display. If we click on the first nucleotide of that line, what happens is it will take that line and search the whole genome for that sequence and color wherever the you find it. So this is basically just showing that, yes, this genic region is flanked by tandem repeats at both sides. And the fact that it's the same color means it's the same sequence. So you can search. Um, this is a similar one, a different flanking sequence. And uh, now we're going to jump to grape. So that's just uh, the reason I used corn to begin with is that's the only plant genome I know of where I have the exon track data, where people have actually figured out where the protein coding regions are. But uh, let's just consider another horticulturally important crop, and that is uh, the grape genome. And here again, you can see very distinct tandem repeat. Now you see there are variations within the tandem repeat. And the question that could be asked, is that noise, like mutations, or is that actually information? These patterns uh, often remind me of Again, ancient history when we had punch cards for computer <laughs> analysis. So, uh, and you can see how the repeat map very, very uh, easily detects this. And also the, how the repeat map is telling us that right here, there is an exon. So visualization, data visualization is a powerful tool when you're exploring the unknown. This is uh, just more tandem repeats. Uh, some of them are you know, very uh, conserved. Some of them are broken up. Is that by design or by mutation? I don't know. So I just, does the program automatically uh, generate the patterns that you see on the left? Because if, if, you know, if the frame was wider or narrower, right. you wouldn't necessarily right. 
Good, good point. So um, this, the repeat map finds these repeats instantly, and regardless of your frame width, you have to find, you have to bring this red line in. You see the red line might have been here. I brought it over to the, over the white, first white line, and that tells me, number one, it tells me that um, this is a 66 base pair repeat. It's 66 base pairs from here to here. And then I can set the width, and then everything lines up, and I can see what's going on. So uh, we do have a function which I, I didn't, while we were live, uh, I didn't hit the alignment cylinder display. But basically, it takes the tandem repeat and turns it into a coil, and then adjusts the coil width to all the tandem repeats are visible. We actually believe that tandem repeats coil in the nucleus, and so they form like uh, solenoid-like structures and that that's what these repeats are all about. <clears throat> so this is a, just a striking uh, component of, if you zoom out, so you're looking at a whole grape chromosome, what you see is this 66 base pair repeat is massively throughout the center of this chromosome, like just um, um, millions of nucleotides are, are just coding for this repeat. So. Okay, this is the same repeat actually showing the, the solenoid display. And so you can see, we believe that this is not, in nature, it can't raster. <laughs> that rastering, you know, this is a nice 2D display, but this is meant to be a 3D display. We can make that spin. And we can, uh, we believe this is the actual structure in biology. It just keeps coiling, because it, DNA, it turns out, wants to align with its own similar sequence. And so the logical thing for a repeat is to form a coil. So this is, uh, again, an, in grape showing. Uh, but we don't have it. There's no published exons, to my knowledge, for grape. But we would predict there's an exon here, almost certainly an exon here, and, and possibly exons here. The blue line is a str strength indicator. And when it goes to purple, that means, bingo, you've definitely got an exon. So just more ex evidence of exons. Um, a little more of the same. So I'm just going to keep moving because, you know, I could show you zillions of pictures. I've mentioned that there are thousands and thousands. These are just a few snapshots of the genome. But the tomato genome is a sim another horticulturally important crop where they've completed the genome and assembled it. And what you see here, again, is um, there's some strange uh, repeats here, which are fuzzy. They're ill-defined. Uh, we have the three-mer pattern, which is a very strong indication that there's protein coding here. And then, and then these other ones are possible exons. Since exons only represent 1% to 2% of the genome, it's critical to be able to identify where they are. More potential exons um, and showing some of the larger tandem repeats that would be, you know, these really big wavy repeats that I show you. There's a name for that. It's called alpha satellite DNA. And, uh, and so all plants and animals, when you see the wavy pattern, you know you're looking at alpha satellite DNA. It's a, all higher organisms show this wavy pattern. And uh, oh, I know. I want to go back for a second. Um, you see that there's a region here that's got more red and green and versus the other bluer areas. So this is a GC-rich region, so it's a potentially a gene. And again, you'll see it's bracketed by a tandem repeat. So the same pattern we saw in corn is showing up in tomato. And to my knowledge, this pattern has never been seen before and until I've seen it in the last few months as I've been looking at plant genomes more. So this is, this is the idea of data visualization, is it will show you patterns that a computer wouldn't have spotted. What we see is these things come in pairs, and they tend to bracket protein coding regions. What are they doing? We don't know, but it gives us reason to want to do research on that. Um, a lot of things are actually repeated. Uh, so there's a lot of repetition in the genome. So that's uh, more of these bracketed areas, you see. This is, uh, this is an important um, clue as to what's going on in the genome. And None of these have been annotated. So it's all, we're, you know, it's really showing us things about the genome we wouldn't have known without it. Then the rice genome, this is really a pretty picture. It's a picture of the, uh, 
the centromeric alpha D DNA, alpha DNA of rice. And I'll just show it quickly because rice, like corn, the monocots are really have really different genomes. They have a, you just notice the color is different. There's much more red and green, greenish yellow and much less blue. So when you're in the dicots, everything's bluish and everything's orangish when you go here. We've zoomed in so you can see a little more specifically the patterns that are occurring within the deviations within the tandem repeat. And there's some interesting things that are going on here that would be worthy of exploration. And you can see here in greater detail, it goes a, a dark column, a dark column, a light column, a dark column, a dark column, a light column. So you can see more clearly uh, what's, what, what that three-mer display is, what it's telling us. It's telling us every third nucleotide is similar to the three, to the one that was th three nucleotides before it. And that's so basically the lighter the pixel, the more the similarity averaged over the whole string. So another thing that uh, is a major feature of genomes that we're seeing is the every other pattern. And this is basically black and blue alternating, uh, sprinkled with, uh, with greens and reds. And so we have no idea what that is but it's throughout plant and animal genomes. So I don't doubt for a minute that it's doing something. Um, this is just more evidence of exons. In rice, this pattern is very strong. And you can also see the GC rich, and you can even see the alignment. Things are lining up here partially because, the, because of this uh, pattern is very, very strong. It, it means it constrains most of the nucleotides in the genome. A lot of us, you know, we've been taught that most nucleotides are just drifting and they don't matter. Uh, most nucleotides in the genome have a function and therefore um, need an explanation. More, more exons, just really, rice is really, really strong signal. Um, okay, so that's, that's the kind of a quick overview of what plant genomes look like when they're visualized with Skittle. Skittle is a um, program that's in development. In fact, some of these features, the feature that measures the, the, where the exons are, the strength of that signal, uh, was just, is just two days old. So Josiah emailed me the latest revision. Uh, so it's all still being improved. But what, what we believe we have here is a universal genome browser. Now, some of you know what a genome browser is. But basically, if you're looking at, you know, let's say, three billion letters, and you're trying to figure out what it all codes for, you can't just look at the letters. And so they've made genome browsers that help you spot where the genes are, help you analyze where the junk or the repeat is, and other types of um, you know, uh, understanding of how, how the genome is operating. We feel that Skittle is the foundation for developing. All of those, all those browsers are one-dimensional. They're strings. And so this is a two-dimensional display, two-dimensional analysis. And, be, and uh, it lets us, we believe it's the next generation of genome browser, and that this, we, when we get Skittle fully developed, we can uh, annotate and recognize every feature within the genome in a way that's fundamentally better than genome browsers today. So we're excited about that. Um, and it's uh, already, I think, bearing fruit in terms of giving us new insight into plant genomes and other genomes. But uh, I wanted to add just briefly, um, some work that my colleague Josiah Seaman did on his own. So Josiah Seaman's, you know, a computer scientist. Oh, I have to I digress for a second. Um, so I was, um, I was never interested in computer science, not even a little bit. And, um, and so I looked at it as a necessary evil. I mentioned that, you know, I was the last one in our department to switch from the typewriter to, to a computer for word processing. And then when email came along, I absolutely did not want to be bothered by email. I was absolutely the last person in our department to finally connect to the email. So it's really funny to me that in the last 10 years, I've uh, played a role in developing what I think are the two most exciting bioinformatics programs available. And of course, the reason is I had the good sense to partner up with some really brilliant computer scientists, because I'm still practically computer illiterate. But, um, but Josiah, Josiah is one of those people, and um, 
he developed all the programming that went into this. And uh, it turns out that you can look at any patterns with Skittle. Like you can look, open up any text file. You can open up Moby Dick and see what the pattern is. You can also uh, open up computer code. So the way he found out he could open up computer code was when you start Skittle, it asks you what file you want to open. And he forgot that he had already opened Skittle, so he used Skittle to open the Skittle executable code. Does that make sense? And he immediately saw some really surprising patterns. So it turns out that Skittle can be used for analyzing um, executable code. And that's machine language. So that's something no computer, no computer scientist, almost no computer scientist can read machine language. So this is the first time we actually get to look at computer code. Uh, I don't have the, uh, that would make a really interesting talk. But I just want to give you some highlights from what he saw. Um, this is Moby Dick. So there's no, no pattern, no nucleotide bias. This is the repeat map. There's no significant amount of repeats. That would be pretty boring, wouldn't it, to have two, the same chapter twice in a row? Um, so the genome for decades has been called the book of life. But we assert strongly that the actual genome has no uh, physical similarity to a book. And a book is passive, but a computer program is active and runs. It's alive. So here's what uh, we, this is a zoomed out version of a, one, one of these is executable code, zoomed out so you look at the whole code, uh, maybe 60,000 bytes of code. And the other one is a zoomed out so you can see most of a chromosome. Which one is code and which one is, ex, uh, which one is genome? They both have these, uh, these, these major shifts in color change. Uh, so in DNA, we would call the, in chromosomes, we'd say these are isochores, where you have a change in the use of, where the, the use of the nucleotides changes in a fundamental way. Well, it turns out that computer code does the same thing, but we actually know what causes these shifts in, in color. See, we know how computer code works, but we don't know how genomes work. And the fact that we're seeing similarities means we could use one to understand the other. When you have a change here, they're going like from Perl to Fortran. It's a computer, it's a, when you change languages, you change your letter use profile, right? These, these are clearly language changes, and these are in, gene, in the genome are most likely changes to one of the many, you know, there are many languages in the DNA. Yes, sir? The computer code is uh, zero, zero is A, zero, one. It, we need two bits to get the four color scheme. Uh, the book was, I think actually we had 26 colors. Okay. Yeah. But they were shades that your eye couldn't distinguish. So, uh, so in terms of these changes in letter use, uh, computer code and, and he's looked at other executable code other than his own program. We've opened up lots of, and it's, it's pretty universal pattern. Um, then he looked at, um, again, we're zooming out, so we're looking at a whole chromosome. This is um, what's called the repeat map, but on a higher scale. So here we have, for example, a long stretch of red, which means that a short repeat, um, less than 20 base pairs long, is repeating. And it's repeating for thousands and maybe tens of thousands of letters here. Just this huge repeat. And so you can map where all these repeats are in a chromosome. And you see they tend to be all be at the, near the beginning. Well, it turns out that the uh, computer code is also filled with repeats. And for example, here would be another stretch of red. That also is a 10 to 20 uh, character repeat. And, and you'll see that which, which one is, if I asked you, if I hadn't already given it away, you wouldn't know which one was a computer code and which one was the genome, would you? And so if we look closer at these repeats, which of these repeats is plant repeat and which one is from computer code? This is plant, this is a computer. So um, the, the, the tandem repeats in computer code are incredibly similar to what we see in plants. Amazingly similar. So here's the interesting thing is for decades people have seen 
we have known that there are these tandem repeats. And they said, obviously, repeats are junk. Well, are the repeats in computer code junk? Are there, is there a single bit in a computer code that's not functional? So it strongly suggests that these tandem repeats aren't here, that this isn't a coincidence, it reflects functionality. And that the, the, we actually know what these repeats are for. These are data files. Like a you know, phone directory would be a data file. The first, this would be like uh, some universal thing like telephone number and then people have different numbers. So data files uh, in computer code give you this. Perhaps these are data files. So these, another element of plant genome is that um, they're called what are dispersed repeats. You know, you can have repeats where they're head to toe or you can have the same repeating element all throughout the genome. And so these, these would be called, um, these would be plant, this would be like a transposable element, and these would be words that are common within the computer language. So you can actually you know, write in a, a, any sequence you want, and it'll look through, through the uh, script and find wherever it occurs. So you can find out how abundant certain words are. So word structure use or transposable elements are very similar within code and within uh, genomes. So the bottom line is uh, w what he's seen is that genomes and executable code have amazing similarities. They both use li linear strings of code. They both use multiple languages. They both use parallel processing, which means you, know, you can have lots of genes being reading at the same time, like, each, like lots of processors in your computer. Uh, they both have a strong character bias where the, the total color shift occurs. They both use extensive use of recurrent tandem repeats. They both use commonly dispersed repeats or words. They both use large-scale localization of the repeats at near the end of, ends of the program. And they both have passive and active information. A book just sits there. You can read it or not. A program runs. And it's self-changing, self-modifying. So, uh, all of this is consistent with a trend within genetics. More and more genomicists are saying the genome is executable code. And that's really a better understanding than the idea that it's an instruction manual. And so it's just really um, exciting to see uh, that Skittle strongly supports that. And if it goes from a simile or an analogy to actually a um, something we can measure, where we can actually measure the, the features that are in common. So I'd just like to conclude. Uh, I believe there are deep hidden, there's deep hidden beauty in the genome. And so I've gazed at these colorful pictures for uh, hundreds of hours. And uh, it's really cool. The genome has many levels of structure. We've only detected a small fraction of it. The nucleotide bias is very strong, uh, which is interesting because uh, Blue-black blue areas want to mutate to red-green, and red-green areas want to mutate to blue-black. So it's very hard to imagine how to create or sustain those biases. Um, Tandem repeats, it's clear because they bracket the genes, can carry information. They are not necessarily junk. Tandem repeats, can, we, can, we show, can log would logically form into large coils, which might have function. We see ubiquitous tumor and thremer patterns, which the thremer seems to reflect codon bias, protein coding bias. And then there are many levels of order still waiting to be found. And higher genomes are most like computer code. That's, that's uh, the bottom line of what we've been learning the last few years using Skittle. That's a good place to stop. <laughs> Well, the one connection I would suggest is that uh, there's communication at every level, you know, from the molecules to the cells to the tissues to communication between organisms. And then, of course, there's the brain function, which is all, all kinds of levels of communication there. So information is at the, at the heart of 21st century biology. It's all really about information science. and um, and Everything is integrated at a level that blows our mind. And so uh, it's very hard to conceive of how that integration 
could have ever arisen. And so it's just a really interesting question that I think more and more people are going to be asking is, biology is much more fantastic than we ever imagined. And uh, so it's just a real, it makes it exciting to be a biologist in the 21st century. Right. So um, basically, for data visualization, you have to be creative in, in presenting the data in new ways to the human brain. The human brain works by methods we have no idea. But um, when we do see a pattern, like I'm seeing this pattern where I have a, what looks like a large coding region that has not previously been identified as a exon, and I see it's bracketed by tandem repeats, and I realize that's a highly ordered structure. And uh, what Josiah points out is he says, uh, Skittle is for discovering the pattern, but then you have to write special computer code to analyze the pattern. So now we can go back and ask the computer to find every instance on that chromosome where that pattern happens. And that's the next step for that research. Yeah. What's the plan for Skittle? And it's still under development and it, it, it's, it's available free of charge. You can download it anytime. It's really easy to, you know, it's a really easy to understand how to use it, but it will continue. It's being updated almost weekly. So, it, and actually, Josiah has just introduced a feature. So, if you're online and you're using Skittle and he updates it, there a little thing will come up on Skittle that says update now, and you'll get the latest version. So, he realizes that it's going to be under rapid and continuous improvement. So, so, they don't have, there's nothing like Skittle. No one has a program like Skittle. Um, I wish they would take notice of Skittle, but they haven't. Uh, I think as we, uh, actually this corn pattern that I described, when we show that we use Skittle to discover that, which, I, which is I think a major feature of the corn genome, uh, then people will say, oh, I guess maybe I should look into this Skittle business. Because it is a powerful tool to just see what's going on. And also for teaching, if you were teaching a genome to students and you just show them A's, T's, C's, and G's, you, you, they, it doesn't sink in. But with Skittle, actually, you can start to see, oh, I see what's going on here. There's, I start to see the different types of organization within the genome. So I think uh, it's both a research tool and a, a great teaching tool. Uh, yes, we, we basically upload uh, any FASTA file. And uh, it, it basically, the first thing it does is just colorize the letters. That's really simple. But as soon as that happens, you start to see patterns. Then it allows us to change the width or zoom in and out. And it allows us to put up the repeat map or the cylinder display or several other display options. So it, but the raw data is that uh, colorful screen. And you're actually looking at the genome when you look at that, just like you were see, looking at a FASTA file. But it's a lot more interesting than a FASTA file. So your repeat file is grabbed from the raw data? So, so the repeat map takes the first line, whatever, whatever the width is, it reads the first line and then compares that to the, the, to the one nucleotide over, the line that represents the next nucleotide over. And then it compares that first line with every other possible alignment on, in the view. And then for every alignment, it, it gives a score for the similarity and decides how bright the pixel should be for that spot. So it's, uh, it performs a massive, uh, calculation each time you move the screen to recognize all the possible similarities between the first string and all the other parts of that display. The, the width thing, it seems to me that the width determines the pattern you can see. Yep. So is there, do you optimize the width to come up with the best visualization of patterns? So the, dis <laughs> the display pattern, the, the, the repeat map, which is the black and the gray, yeah. the gray scale, uh, that actually doesn't change as you change width. It is, it is just measuring the repeats. So you'll see those repeats uh, regardless of the display. And then the cylinder display uh, finds the best alignment. But the regular display, you have to manually uh, adjust the width to get those nice uh, visual patterns of the uh, tandem repeats. So there's possibly been a pattern in, in width, like So there's a, the, the 66 mer that I found in tomato was also in corn. Okay, that's, yeah. yeah, there's there's uh, and and when you find a repeat, you'll find that it's a family of repeats throughout that chromosome and all the chromosomes of that species. Very few repeats are novel. They're 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 like words. They're doing something and 
and, they, and they're found in many different places in the genome. So basically, um, as, as we discover these new layers of information, we would like to have it like, you know how old-fashioned overhead transparencies? You could put several on top, and they'd, you could see how they all line up. We'd like to have Skittle have transparent pages. So might, you, know, you could adjust the transparency. So we can see where the exons are. We can see where the transcriptional factor binding sites are. We can see where the histone binding sites are. We can see where the fold, folding uh, <coughs> motifs are. Because there's layer upon layer of information, and the only way is to have layered, a layered display. So that's the next. Uh, that's in the works. Thank you very much. Thanks. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.